the crescendo of the mountaintop experience that Elijah had in front of the nation of Israel has quickly died down now. The altar has been repaired. The sacrifice has been made. The rain has fallen. The earth has been quenched. The animal's thirst has been satiated. The people's spirits have been renewed or restored to a certain degree. And it looks like the hand of the Lord is back in the nation of Israel. And there's a preacher who's been hiding for three and a half years, fed by ravens, drinking water out of a brook and not really having anybody to have any fellowship with but the Lord. And he's gone up and been obedient to what God has asked him to do. And if anybody has ever brought down fire from heaven, he certainly did. And the promise as they went out was, if God speaks, He'll be our God. And if Baal speaks, He'll be our God. And our God spoke. Yeah. Amen. He burned up the offering and the water. So hot was the fire that it turned the stones to powder. And a cloud about the size of a man's hand brought a thirsty land the necessity of life, which was water. And the preacher ran back to Israel thinking, we're going to have revival. God has answered miraculously. I mean, who wouldn't have thought the same thing? And he comes back to find closed doors and people that are not rejoicing at all and the temple still empty and the promises of the people broken. And there's a knock at his door And it's an emissary from the king's court. You can tell by looking at the chariot, the symbol that is on the side of the chariot, they realize who this is from. And here's an individual with a scroll in his hand. And he steps there to the door and Elijah's servant goes to that door and says, Hey preacher, somebody's at the door. And, and who is it? It's not Amazon. It's from the king's court. I think maybe for a moment Elijah probably thought to himself, well, praise the Lord. Maybe at least he'll finally do what they've been promising to do. One, recognize where the problem really was. And two, restore the nation of Israel and their form of worship as it ought be. But his heart stops suddenly almost as if he had a heart attack. When the seal on that letter is broken, and Elijah said, hey, listen, my glasses are upstairs. Can you just read it for me? He says, uh, preacher, this letter's from Jezebel, and it says, if I don't make you as one of my prophets before day's end, my name's not Jezebel. And I think his heart just broke like an eggshell under a giant's heel. I think he honestly cared about the nation of Israel. And so he gathered his things together, few though they were, and took his servant, and off he goes. 
many people would say as when we study the Bible, so often we try to make sense or reason as to why something occurs. Most people would question, why did Joseph wind up in a pit and then wind up down there at Potiphar's house falsely accused and then in a prison before he finally gets to the palace? Or you might even think about the Apostle Paul who the Bible says that the devil gave him a thorn in the flesh, a minister of Satan to buffet him so that he would not be exalted above measure. Or maybe you'd think about Daniel who found something in the lion's den. Or maybe the three Hebrew children in a fiery furnace. You might even think outside of that fiery furnace, you might consider for just a moment, Peter looks like was definitely crucified upside down. None of the people that worked for the Lord seemed to ever be able to get a break until the life hereafter. It seems odd that if I was going to write a book, I, I try to encourage people to get saved. I might want to leave those kinds of stories out. But oftentimes human suffering comes our way. And the Bible says when you come to the end of chapter 18 and you're into chapter number 19 now in 1 Kings, the Bible says in the hand of the Lord was on Elijah. Funny way of showing it. Could you bear with me for just a few moments? I'm just going to tell you a, a Bible story this morning. Amen. I'm going to tell you about what I think is probably the greatest preacher in the Old Testament. I know the Lord says in the New Testament, no greater preacher born of a woman than John the Baptist. I understand that. I know where the context is. But this man, Elijah, has done everything he's been told to do. And as a matter of fact, he's done it exactly like God would have him to do it. And yet, can I say this? He never had any results. The nation of Israel didn't turn. The king and his wife didn't repent. But more importantly, Elijah the preacher got depressed. What a depressing thing to talk about how life really is. Because there is no one existing today, short of maybe little children who don't understand it, who do not go through expectations that have been literally torn to pieces and things not work out the way that they had them drawn up. I wonder, many of you have heard me tell the story before about uh, my own parents coming together and my dad giving up professional baseball and so on and so forth and deciding to go to Bible school and my mom winds up pregnant and he had decided if he couldn't play baseball, he was going to have his own baseball team. And the first of nine was fixing to be born. His name would have been Stephen. And well into her labor, he shows up from school and comes into the hospital room and the doctor in a drunken stupor came in and using a pair of forceps went in and the wrong way and crushed that baby's brain by that head, did brain damage and within two days and two nights that baby was gone. I can't even imagine. They're young, serving the Lord, He's actually pastoring two churches, if you can imagine that. One on the first and third Sunday, the other one on the second and fourth. On the fifth, they'd get together for singing. That's how Southerners do it. And he's doing everything he knows to do in the way he knows how to do it. And he has completely surrendered to the Lord. And their first child, within two days and two nights of birth, they're having a funeral processional for that child. I don't know how that had to have felt. I can't even imagine, but I know this. I know that in the Bible there seems to be a consistency that even Christian people don't get to avoid trouble. If anything, it looks as if we might even get more. The Apostle Paul said we're troubled on every side. Well, Elijah is no different. I would think after three and a half years of living by yourself that maybe you might possibly 
maybe get a little bit of a break. I mean, he goes up and preaches. Now, lest you think that he's fearful, understand this. Do you understand he stood in front of the entire nation of Israel as well as 850 prophets of Baal? Be careful about accusing him of being a coward. Be careful about drawing the conclusion that oftentimes many people do. As a matter of fact, many students oftentimes will say, well, he was running from a woman. Well, okay, maybe, but I think there's a little bit more to the story because if you continue to read down there, you know what you find out? If he wanted to die, he had a great opportunity because he gets there under the juniper tree. You know what he says? It's enough, Lord. Just let me die. In the New Testament sense, he's a saved man. He's a preacher. He's a prophet. He's done miracles. Phenomenal miracles. He was God's man for that hour. The chosen prophet of God who went up, did what God said to do, and the fire fell and the people lied. And what does he get as a parting gift? If I don't make you like you made my prophets by the end of today. Wow, I don't know. Thanks, Lord. I appreciate it. The nation of Israel now has water and they're wanting to kill me. I've thought when he left with his servant, maybe some of you have heard the story before, as he begins to walk, he's moving directly toward the wilderness. He's going toward the desert. He comes to the edge of no man's land there and and he pauses for a moment and he looks at his servant and he said, you don't need to go where I'm going and where I'm going, I'm not planning on coming back from it. And that servant, you know what he does? He departs and leaves the preacher on the edge of that wilderness. And the preacher without even looking back bows his head and walks on out into the desert. Oh, it's hot. It's smoking hot. That sand is all in his sandals and that sun is beating upon that bald head and he pulls that drape up over his head and and now all of a sudden, even though he's only wearing a cloak, it's as if the burden of the entire world is laying upon his shoulders. His shoulders are humped in this way. His head is bowed down low. His back has a curve in it. And each step becomes painstakingly closer as dehydration begins to to set in and his eyes begin to hurt from tears that course their way down until they have literally been drained from his tear ducts. And the tear ducts no longer have the ability to produce any more water. Little salt trails have found their way down his cheeks. He's heartbroken. I don't see him as many do, running in fear for his life. I see Elijah broken hearted and feeling like a failure. Preacher, where do you get that? I read the passage. As he begins to go into the desert, what is unknown to him is of all the things that are in the desert there happens to be a special place that the Lord, unbeknownst to him, has prepared for him. The same way the Lord prepared a burning bush for Moses. He's prepared a juniper tree for Elijah. And for all of us who may find the need to on occasion crawl underneath that juniper tree, it's right in the corner of Juniper Junction. And he begins to walk and he begins to get more and more tired. He has no provisions. Least of all water. And he goes out and 
and the sun begins to set off in the distance and that bright yellow golden color begins to dip behind the horizon and it begins to turn first with all those colors of orange and maybe some pinks begin to get dropped in there and the sun begins to get painted. The skyline begins to turn sort of a reddish color and all of a sudden it's as if that entire sun as it's going down is just a red ball of agony. The wind begins to blow and he looks in the distance and he sees just a juniper tree. Not a beautiful, gorgeous tree that you might imagine in all of its splendor like you might see in Washington at the time when the cherry blossoms come or over in Japan when they begin to go, they call it sakura. That's mean all of a sudden the cherry blossoms, they fall like snow. No, it's just a nondescript juniper tree. And in his demented mind and an exhaustion, he says, well, I guess that's as good a place as any, and I guess that juniper tree will be my gravestone. I'll, I'll just go and lay down there. The tops of his feet will be burned by now. He'll be weak as a kitten. He couldn't fend off a wild animal if it charged at him. And he has no more strength to run. Complete physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual exhaustion. And the Lord's prepared for him a juniper tree. But he doesn't know that the place that he thinks is his demise is actually going to be a place of promise. He doesn't realize that his fiery furnace is going to be where he gets to see a side of Jesus that other people don't get to see. Yeah. Amen. He doesn't realize that the fiery furnace is going to be a place where the Son of God is. He doesn't know that. Can I say that when we get in that state of mind, we forget who is our God and whom it is that we serve. Lays down there, I have no doubt in my mind there's the bones of many a dead animal there. There's no question there have been the remains of other animals that have sought that one shady place in the entire desert, that one place that they've gone there many times and have most likely been trapped in that place and used or eaten for dinner. But he doesn't care. It doesn't matter. It's enough, Lord. Just let me die. Do you know what he said prior to that statement? For I am no better than my father's. Who would ever think the sin of comparison can lead you to the point of wanting to die? Thank the Lord God sees things differently than we do. Amen. But sometimes when we get that tunnel vision, you know what we think? Lord, I cannot take any more. I'm done. I'm through. I'm finished. Hey, could I say this to you just as a positive thing, if you'll just bear with me a few minutes here this morning. Could I say this to you? Listen, just because you're done, don't think for a second that you're not in good company. Amen. You know what Peter said? I'm going fishing. Yeah. There's no way the Lord's going to want me. I denied Him. I deserted Him. I betrayed Him. I'm out of here. I'm going back to what I did before. God can't use me now, not after what I did. I'm going fishing. He curls up. He's dehydrated. It's strange how that thing works because you actually need fluids because you don't recognize you're shivering and you're shaking and you're trembling. And the reason that you're doing all that is because you actually need fluids, but now you're freezing to death in the blistering sun. 
And he curls up, I think, in the fetal position. And the animals begin to close in. There's always hyenas laughing at you at the lowest point. And there's always lions roaring, waiting to take over when you die. And the animals begin to close in. And he has that time of prayer, of looking back. You see, you know something, Lord? There's no point in me even being alive. I've amounted to absolutely nothing. I'm no better than my father's. It's enough. You've given me enough chances. I'm a failure. I'm no good. Just let me die. And with that, those old crusty eyelids come to a close. And as he shakes and he trembles like a a newborn baby that's gotten out from underneath their swaddling cloth and they're shaking and they're trembling. And as the animals begin to close in and think about the meal they're about to have, the lion of the tribe of Judah breaks through in the desert place where you would least expect Him. Oh, we expect to see Him on the mountaintop. And we expect to see Him in a stormy sea. But we don't expect to see Him in the dry desert. I think He walks by and He looks at that preacher. I really don't think He makes fun of him. I don't think He kicks him. I don't think He says, after all I've done for you, couldn't you be grateful? I don't think he does any of that. You know, if he was wearing a cloak, you know what I think he would do? I think he would follow his own teachings. I think when he taught over in the book of Matthew that if someone asks for your coat, give them your cloak also, I think the Lord's like, I think I'm just going to go ahead and do this. I think that's what he was thinking about. I think he covers him up. I think maybe he takes his fingers and sort of brushes that old white hair out of his face and he sees in the moonlight where those tears have now dried stains on his cheeks. Did you know that even grown men cry? Amen. Why, the Bible says that Jesus wept. Yes. Gentlemen, when was the last time tears wetted your cheeks? He goes over and Elijah's sound asleep. You might even say dead to the world. And he builds a fire. Don't know where he got the matches, but he had them. He sets a cruise of water right by his head. So the first thing he sees when he wakes up is water. See, Elijah is dehydrated and he doesn't even know it. Part of the reason Elijah is thinking out and being, in a sense, crazy out of his mind is because he doesn't even realize he's thirsty. The nation of Israel had gotten thirsty. God had not allowed the rain to fall, but He was trying to show them a spiritual lesson. He said, your cisterns are broken. They're not holding water anymore. And your problem is, is not just the physical water. You're missing the water of the wellspring of life. You're dying of dehydration. You're acting out of character because you're thirsty. When was the last time you paused to go, I wonder if I just need a drink from the wellspring of life. When was the last time you paused to think, maybe I'm acting stupid because I'm spiritually dehydrated. Maybe I need to go to the water fountain. Maybe I need to immerse myself in it 
Remember when the woman at the well came? Do you remember? She came with a pot and he says to her, well, what are you doing here? And she said, well, I came to get some water. He said, yeah, me too. And he said, if you'll give me some water, I'll give you some water that you'll never thirst again. Could I just give you something to consider? Have you ever paused for just a minute? And it's just not an old prostitute, an old home wrecker who had had five other husbands and the one she was with wasn't her own. Have you ever paused to just remember maybe she acted out of character because she is thirsty? Yes. Maybe she was looking for something. Maybe she was playing that part because she was dying of thirst and she was looking to quench her thirst in some other way. And so guess what? She only did what she knew to do. I don't know. Maybe you never paused to think what happened to that little girl when she was a little girl. Maybe something dried her up. And caused her to be such a mess. Yes. Yes. But she came to the well and Jesus knew she needed a drink. Amen. That's why He said, if you'll give me something to drink, I'll give you a drink. You'll never thirst again. Is it possible that before you cast the stones at that home wrecker that you might pause a minute and realize maybe she was thirsty? Maybe the reason for the problems you're having today is you're dehydrated spiritually. And you're in church. And you hear a quartet get up and sing, man, about the blood. And you're, eh. and then you hear about that unseen hand. And you're like, well, everybody else. And the Lord said, no, here's a juniper tree. Where does a juniper tree exist in the desert? In a dry place. Very dry place. Starts a fire. Why you need light in a dark spot. You need warmth in a cold spot. You need a fire to be able to heat food to cook it. But there's nothing like a fire to cause fellowship. Did you know that the colors that a fire puts off has a natural way of releasing certain types of melatonin in your system? It doesn't come from a bright white fluorescent light. It comes from the color of a flame. It comes from a fire. Candles relax you much more than a flashlight does. It builds a fire. Because he's planning on setting a spell and spending some time with a thirsty old preacher. You know, preachers actually need fellowship with the Lord too. You know that? I think you like this. I think he's, he sees him over there stirring. He's probably jumping every now and then. And finally, he wakes himself up and he looks over there across the fire. You imagine what it must have been like for him to look and finally see the one he's been preaching about? Can you imagine what that must have been like? That must have been quite a shock. He had to have thought. They didn't have crack back then, but they had, I must have been smoking it. I mean, I mean, he went out there by himself. He was all alone. He went out there to die. And now there's a feller sitting across from him with a fire going. Cruise of water by his head and biscuits in the pan. Oh, he's got to be thinking, wow, the bed might be a little rough, but man, if this is heaven. Maybe the Lord said, morning preacher.
You know what the tendency is, is when the Lord says morning preacher, is our first response is, Lord, I'm sorry. I messed up again. I'm lower than whale poop in the bottom of the ocean, Lord. I'm no good. Are you here to just take me home? Kill me now? The Lord's like, no, I figured I might be thirsty. There's some water there for you. I built the fire just close enough so you can feel the heat coming off of it. He looks down and he says, where'd, where'd this come from? He said, oh, that's my robe. I gave it to you. You can have it. I'm going to come back to that robe in a minute. It's a very special robe. A little later on, you know what it's called? It's called a mantle. Mm-hmm. wonder where he got that from. I wonder why Elisha so bad wanted that mantle. I wonder if when the Lord got caught up, and he, I'm already talking about the mantle. <laughs> I wonder why the Bible makes such a big deal about that mantle coming down from heaven and him running like a center fielder after a fly ball trying to catch that mantle. I wonder if it's because of where that mantle came from. I bet you that old preacher had sat down with that young buck and said, let me tell you a story. Let me tell you what the Lord did for me. Oh, are you going to tell us about raising the dead, calling down fire on Mount Carmel? Are you going to tell us that? No, I'm going to tell you about the juniper tree in the desert when I was done, finished. Highlight of my career. Best thing that ever happened was when I said, it's enough, Lord, let me die. I started living. That day, I never realized how good it was to be under the juniper tree. Oh, let me hurry. I don't know what it would be like to have a biscuit served to you from the Lord. Could you imagine that? I, y'all are like, oh, sure. I mean, why wouldn't he? It's like, I can't imagine. I'd be like, the bread of life giving you the bread of life. Right. <laughs> you, you got to, and here's Elijah. He looks down there, he grabs that biscuit, and he starts to go, wait, hey, whoa, 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 hang on there, there, cool breeze, just a second. Might want to bless it. Uh, Lord, could you do that? <laughs> Maybe the Lord breaks it. And he says, Father, we sure do thank you for this bread. Thank you for my preacher. And thank you I got here just in time. <laughs> And help him to enjoy this to the nourishment of his body. He sets that thing down. Elijah says, surely you're going to eat? And he said, no, I got bread you know not of. (laughs) Sir, never mind. (laughs) You just go ahead and enjoy yourself. I think the Lord enjoyed watching him eat the biscuits. We used to go to Carolina. Mama Utley, she used to make biscuits. My wife can make pretty much anything you can imagine, but she struggled to make biscuits. Mama Utley finally taught her how to do that. We went up there. Listen, I was so bad about biscuits that at Christmas time, she would mail me a tin (laughs) full of layers of biscuits. It was like a biscuit cake. And we'd take that and she'd wrap it in a paper towel with water or something, heat it up like it had just come out of the oven. Soak that thing in butter and then put whatever on it, honey, blackberry jam, maple syrup. Oh, my goodness. But we would get up there. Mama Utley would make the biscuits. You know what she'd do? She'd just stand there and watch me eat them. Old oh, Pritchard make up a gray mare. That's Cairo syrup and butter mixed together. Oh, make your heart stop. <laughs> just looking at them, mix it. You know, all she'd do, she'd just sit there and watch me eat them. Just, she enjoyed me enjoying it. I'd be so full, they'd be coming out my ears. She'd say, you want another one? And the next morning, we'd wake up. 
Fresh pan of biscuits. I think the Lord just enjoyed watching that boy eat. And sat down across the fire from him. Now, I'm getting close to an end. And he's looking at him. You know, when you eat, it has a tendency to sort of open your eyes up a little bit. You get hungry, you get kind of whacked out, you know, and then you eat a little something, and then all of a sudden, like Jonathan, he dipped the tip of his spear in the honey, and, you know, his eyes were opened. It's like that. So he hasn't eaten in a long time. See, he doesn't realize that he's not just thirsty, he's hungry. You know, it's interesting that the Lord doesn't even carry on a conversation with him until he's fed him and given him something to drink. Did you get that? You got that. Did you get that? See, sometimes we're in such a hurry to try to talk to somebody when all they really need is something to eat and something to drink. They're not even ready to listen to whatever we got to say. You know why? They're hungry and they're thirsty and you know what? They need some warmth. They just need a fire so they can see things. And he eats. Must have been some more conversation. Because after, after a little while, I think Elijah... Now this is me in my mind. The Bible don't say this. It's just how I draw it up. I think all of a sudden he gets, you know, like... You probably don't know this, but people have heroin nods. What they do, they just, they're talking to you and they'll literally, they'll just, they'll, they'll nod off while they're talking to you. And after a while, it gets so bad, they don't even care if you know they're nodding off. Well, I think he gets the biscuit nods. <laughs> you say, where do you get that? It's right in the passage. You say, where? Right in the passage. The Lord said, go ahead and take a nap. That's what it says. He don't say now, but he said, go ahead and sleep. <laughs> you say, why? He's sitting there, man. And I mean, he is trying, man. He's doing all the tricks. Like y'all on a Sunday morning. It's like you're looking at the top of your head and you're thinking, if I look far enough up, oh, my eyes are dark. And maybe he doesn't know. No, you look like Jaws fixing to bite somebody. All I see is these two little white things here. I know what you're doing. It's like you're, you're out of sight. All but the snoring. And finally the Lord said, close your eyes and go to sleep. I think for just a moment. He's kind of coming around now and he's like, I don't really want to die anymore. And I still hear the hyenas and the bears and the lions. I still hear the animals. They're going to attack me. And the Lord said, not with me standing guard, they won't. Oh, you know what he says to him? He said, boy, I've been watching over you since the day you was hatched. He said, I've never taken my eyes off of you. I've known your down sitting and your uprising since the day you got hatched out of your mama over there in Tish. Really? Yep, go ahead and sleep. Here's how I draw it. I'd have the Lord sitting there at the fire and he goes to sleep, the animals come in, I'd have the Lord just go. Amen. Something y'all want? No, sir, just checking. We thought we might just get the perimeter around here and that kind of thing. Leave my preacher alone. We ain't doing nothing. Oh, yes, he is. He's getting some much needed rest. He's taking a nap. How long is he going to sleep? Long as he wants. And I think the Lord stands guard the whole time. Just like He does for you, even though you're not aware that He's there, He's standing guard. He's watching you even. I think I heard a song called The Unseen Hand. Oh, you mean somebody's got my back? Even when I don't know He's got my back? Even when the animals are closing in? Yeah, that's what I mean. He wakes up the next time. He eats again because he's southern. And he gets his biscuits and he gets his water. He's full as a tick. 
And the Lord said, now go on and get. And he takes that mantle. And he said, hey, I sure appreciate it. The Lord said, now just, just keep it. Just keep it? He don't have to ask twice. Okay, good, fine, thank you. And I know he goes to the cave and the Lord speaks to him and tells him, listen carefully now. He says, Elijah, I'm not in the fire. And I'm not in the wind. And I'm not in the earthquake. I'm in the still. Small. Why? Because he's saying to Elijah, as busy as you have been doing all that you have been doing, it's been so noisy you haven't been able to hear me because you've gotten away from me. You've got to be close enough to hear me whisper. You've got to be close so you can hear when I talk. I think Elijah says, you're not going to take my mantle, are you? He said, no. Nope. But I got something to do with it. And he's walking and he finds Elisha. You know what he says? He's the twelfth of the plowing double oxen, their teams of oxen. He's the last plowman. And he walks up to him. You know what he does? He pitches that 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 mantle. He pitches it on him. You know what he says? If it's God, follow me. And if it's not, you got a mantle. And he kept walking. He said, wait, wait, whoa, whoa, hold on, preacher. Let me kill my oxen and let me get my plowshares tore up. I'm not coming back, but I'm, I'm coming. Just give me a minute. I don't know where or how, but Elijah got that mantle back because you don't see it show up again until 10 years later when they crossed the Jordan. And Elijah lets it fall on Elisha for real. Here's the meaning of the message today. Some of you are headed out into the desert. It's hot, it's dry, and it's full of wild animals. And you're not planning on coming back. You've had enough. I'm not making fun of you. Been there. Done that. Got the t-shirt. Coffee mug. Placemats. Pen and pencil set. Baseball hat. But there's a juniper tree in your life. You know what the Lord's saying? Why don't you curl up? under the juniper tree at the worst possible time of your life. And let me show you that I'm still here to take care of you, not to make fun of you. And to tell you, you know what you need? You need some warmth. And you need some light. And you need some fellowship. And you need some food. And you need some water. And you need to know that I'm still here caring for you, even though it feels like I don't care for you. Because when mother and father forsake you, I'll take you up. Father's Day, isn't it? Isn't that just like a good father? Amen. Amen. I got up this morning, my physical father's been gone about 30 years now. I don't have a father here on earth to say Happy Father's Day to. I have a couple of surrogates along the way that have been a real blessing to me. But when my little tootsies hit the ground this morning, the first thing I did was turn my head upward and said, Happy Father's Day. Are you under the juniper tree this morning? Life's passing you by wide open. 
You've had enough. You're up to here with everything. Can I just say this? You're not alone. I'm not just trying to be corny. I'm telling you, there are people in here that have been as many times as I have been to Juniper Junction. Sat down under the juniper tree. And some of what I thought would be the worst times have been the best times because you know what's strange? The host of that juniper tree has never one time not shown up and said, hey boy, that's how he talks to me. Hey boy, yes sir, are you thirsty? Are you hungry? Have you lost your way? Need some direction, some light? Are you cold? Are you distant? You lost your robe along the way? You lost your shoes? Why don't you come on back to the house? Preacher, you really think that happened? I think it's in the Bible for a reason. It shows that even the strongest can have weak moments. I love the reality of the Bible. He would put a story like that in the Bible to help people like me.